Hello friends, would you like to hear an amazing fact? Back in 1933, when the Golden Gate Bridge was being constructed, the chief engineer, Joseph Strauss, wasn't satisfied with the terrible loss of life in building other bridges. And so he incorporated some of the most stringent safety measures ever. For one thing, he gave the men goggles to protect their eyes from the wind there above the bay, gave them cream for their faces. They had hard hats, one of the first times back then in 1933. But probably the most amazing measure, he stretched a net all the way across the bay under the bridge as it was being constructed. During the time of construction, 19 men fell from the bridge, but they were caught by the net. They got the nickname, the Halfway to Hell Club. You know, the Bible tells us that the whole human race has fallen, but Jesus has provided a way to save us from the fall. Stay with us. We're going to talk about it in this presentation of Revelation Now. friends welcome again to revelation now everything is about to change and how true those words seem to be i'd like to welcome you again to this international bible study where we are looking at some of the most important prophecies of the bible and if you'd like to participate in this study but uh, spanish is your preferable language you can actually uh, view this program in spanish translated live by simply going to the Revelation Now Spanish website, or you can see it at Amazing Facts Latino Facebook page and Amazing Facts Latino YouTube channel. We also have sign language for the deaf, and that is available at the Revelation Now website. Uh, once again, we want to remind you, at the conclusion of the presentation this evening, we're going to take some of your Bible questions. We want to thank you for the many Bible questions that have been uh, sent in. And uh, if you'd like to ask a Bible question, uh, in the Facebook page, you can just type your Bible question in the comment section, and we'll try to answer as many of these questions as possible when we get to our Q&A time. Uh, we did get some wonderful testimonies of folks who have been blessed by these meetings so far. And if you've received a rich blessing from these meetings, tell us about it. Send us a, an email and uh, share the blessing that these meetings have been. Uh, we got Myrna from the Philippines speaking of last night's presentation. She said that was such a faith-enriching message. Thank you, Pastor Doug. Uh, Rebecca from uh, Florida says, thank you for your teaching. It is a blessing. She's a truck driver, and she listens to the Revelation Now programs while she's driving on the road. Uh, also, if your group, uh, you have a little group maybe meeting in your home and you'd like to take, to take a picture, you can upload that picture and uh, we'll try and share that. Just do so at the Revelation Now website. Click on the link that says Contact Us and there's a place where you can upload a picture of your site, of your group. I uh, want to remind you, we do have some supplemental material that goes along with each of the presentations. The lesson for tonight is entitled The Ultimate Sacrifice. And if you'd like to get a copy of the lesson, just go to the Revelation Now website and you'll be able to download it for free. Again, it is a supplemental guide after the presentation. We want to encourage you to read through it. You can look up the various Bible verses and fill it in and that'll be an encouragement in your study. We also have a book we'd like to make available to anyone who would like to text and ask for it. All you need to do is text the word CHOICE to the number 405. Four, four, that is if you're in North America. If you're outside of North America, you can also download the book and read it for free at the revelationnow.com website. Tonight's uh, presentation is entitled The Ultimate Sacrifice, and we're looking forward to getting to this important study. And so at this time, I'd like to invite Pastor Doug to come forward, and we will prepare our hearts for this very important study. Now, Pastor Doug... Um, We've been doing these evangelistic meetings together for a number of years, but you've been doing evangelistic meetings or Bible prophecy seminars for how many years? Probably about 35 years, at least 35 years 35 now, years. Not? I know I've been with you in some other countries where we've done meetings like this, but out of the different places that you've done these Bible prophecy seminars, which one stands out in your mind as being just a, a tremendous experience? Oh, wow. Well... You know, uh, I, I sure enjoyed, we were together in India mm -hmm. with Karen 
a couple of years ago and had the opportunity to speak in the largest Christian church in the world. That was pretty neat. <laughs> That's right. Mrs. Batchelor and I went to Russia right after communism fell and to do a meeting there when people had not been allowed to hear the word for mm. 70 years, you can't forget that. Uh, New Guinea, we had over 100,000 people. That was exciting. But you know, going to China and being able to preach publicly and have it recorded they don't allow it now, and they didn't allow it before, but we were able to have one window to do a public evangelistic meeting. That was really pretty special. I think if I remember correctly, Pastor Doug, that was uh, one of the first public Bible prophecy seminars by a foreigner allowed in the country. Yeah. So that was a very unique experience. Yeah, we just praise the Lord and hope that uh, things open up again for China. Yeah, absolutely. Well, before we get to our study, as we always do, let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Father, once again, we are so grateful that we have the freedoms here to open up your word and study. And we thank you for the many people who are joining us uh, all around the world. And Lord, tonight we have such an important subject. So we want to invite the Holy Spirit to come be with us here in the studio and our studio audience, as well as those who are watching and listening all over the country and around the world. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you mm -hmm. for the many blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ross. And Pastor Ross will be back immediately following this part of our presentation where we're going to be uh, doing your Bible questions. And so we encourage you to be writing down any questions you have tonight for our subject where we're going to be talking about the ultimate sacrifice. And you'll be interested in how this relates uh, very much to the book of Revelation. But before we do that, we always like to kind of get some feedback from what people out there on the street are thinking about the subject of salvation. And so uh, we're going to go to our Man on the Street interviews. The word salvation to me means that he saved me from my own sin. He paid the penalty on the cross, and with his shed blood, he made payment for our sins. The word salvation to me means like that there's, a, there's something after death. It, it's always related to the idea that maybe uh, we don't want to be in this life and we want a salvation towards something better. Well, I mean, I can't speak what every individual means, but for me, salvation, hey, I'm a little better now than I was yesterday, and I'll be better for the future. Uh, no, I don't think a person has to believe in God to be saved. A person uh, just has to live uh, a virtuous life by uh, that person's own standards uh, to be saved. If you have heard about him and don't walk in the light, then I don't think that you're going to go to heaven. If you, the only way you can come through, have, get to heaven or get to God is through Jesus Christ. Very interesting. You know, I've read some research that uh, there is a declining interest and a declining faith in the Bible and in Christianity in North America. But in spite of what you may be hearing in the news, it's still over 75% of the people in North America that believe in God, believe in Jesus, and most of those also believe the Bible is inspired or the Word of God. And so uh, you might be thinking, Pastor Doug, I tuned in because I was interested in a Revelation seminar. I think you're going to see tonight that you can't really study the book of Revelation without talking about what is referred to in Revelation chapter 14 as the everlasting gospel. You know, you read in Revelation where it talks about uh, for instance, in Revelation 5, verses 12 and verses 9, I'm going to do these out of order. It describes this scene in heaven where there is a lamb, a very unusual lamb, a lamb that's got seven eyes and seven horns, and it's slain, but it's still alive. And the, the beings in heaven surrounding this scene are declaring, worthy is the lamb who was slain, for you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So it's a very central theme. Matter of fact, the word lamb is found 29 times in the book of Revelation. It's one of the principal characters. And so we need to understand what is this lamb that was slain. I think most of us already know. But you really need to go back in the Bible to get the story. First of all, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, and we touched on this last night, but I know that some people don't catch every presentation. It, it tells us that when they sinned, they initially felt the nakedness. They tried to cover their nakedness with fig leaves. And the Bible tells us actually that uh, they made these aprons of leaf 
And uh, God says that's not going to be adequate because it's not only not enough material, it's the wrong material. And so God gave them tunics or robes of skin. Now in order for them to have these robes of skin, something had to die. And so this would represent the very first death in the universe besides Abel, first creature. I mean, the very, very first death because Abel died after that. And so uh, this is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. God established the sacrificial system. And so they left the Garden of Eden understanding that in the sacrificing of these innocent animals, it had to be a clean animal. Could be a lamb, could be a goat, could be a calf. But these animals were to be a symbol for something uh, that God was going to send his son as a lamb in the future. We remember that story in the Bible that's uh, very touching where in Genesis chapter 22, God speaks to Abraham. And he says, take now your son, your only son Isaac, who you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. Can you imagine what a test that would be? But at this point, Abraham had learned to trust God. He'd gotten in trouble several times before trying to take matters into his own hands. And so with a broken heart, he told Isaac, we're going to go sacrifice to the Lord. And that didn't surprise Isaac, who is now like 18 to 20 years of age. I don't think he woke up and he told Sarah, took some servants, and they took the, the uh, things that were necessary for the sacrifice, at least most of them. They went to the mountains of Moriah, and when they got to the foot of the mountains, it says they went three days' journey. He left the servants there, and he said, the lad and I will return to you. Then he put the wood on Isaac's back. Abraham had this probably a bronze censer with a burning coal in it. They didn't have matches back then for the fire. They started up the mountain. Now Isaac had gone to sacrifice with his father many times. Abraham was the high priest for the family. And he noticed something very obvious was missing. And pretty soon he broke the silence with that eternal question. Father, we've got the wood. It was on Isaac's back. So we've got the fire. But where is the lamb? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb. Now, that's really a, a double answer. God did provide a lamb because up on the mountain, when Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac, he explained to his son, this is what God's asked me to do. And Isaac was a willing sacrifice. Abraham didn't jump on his son and lasso him like a calf and tie him up. Isaac could have easily wrestled free. Abraham is over 100 years of age now. He told his son, he says, this is what God's asked me to do. And Isaac was a willing sacrifice. So Abraham bound him. They had the stack of rocks. They put the wood there. He laid his son on the wood. And just before the knife came down, Abraham was willing to do it. The Bible tells us an angel stopped him. And he said, Abraham, Abraham, do no harm to the lad. Because uh, God has now tested your faith. And off in the distance, they saw a ram was caught by his horns in a thicket, and the word thicket means a thorn bush. So here you've got a ram with a crown of thorns that took the place of Isaac. Now think about this, friends. Abraham went three and a half days to the place of sacrifice with the son. Jesus ministered for three and a half years. The wood was placed on Isaac's back. The cross was placed on Jesus' back. The father and the son, they went to the place of sacrifice together. And just before Abraham offered his son, God stopped him. And basically, I think that Abraham understood that God was going to give his son. This was really just a test of faith and a test of love. And you can even read where Jesus says in John chapter 8 to the religious leaders. He said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and he was glad. And they're saying, how could you say Abraham rejoiced to see your day? You're not even 50 years old. And Abraham lived 2,000 years ago. Jesus means up there on the mountain with Isaac, Abraham saw the sacrifice of God's son. The whole plan of salvation was represented in this. And then, of course, finally, it's acted out in the New Testament. Let's, with that as an introduction, get into question number one. Whom did the animal that was sacrificed in Isaac's place represent? When Jesus came to the Jordan to be baptized, John the Baptist looked at him. The Holy Spirit said, this is the one. And he declared, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You know, that's a wonderful statement, friends, that if, uh, if Jesus can take away 
the sin of the world. Can he handle your sin? I remember going out to split firewood with my boys when they were young. And one day in particular, I was cutting wood with Mike. And, and uh, we gave him a little plastic hatchet. And uh, he, I'd give him a piece of wood. And he's, you know, like five years old. And, he, and uh, he'd be hacking away with the wood. And uh, I was using a 16-pound splitting maul. I was a little younger and stronger back then to split wood. And he tried to pick it up. And he couldn't even pick it up. And it would be very odd for him to say to me when I tried to pick up his plastic axe, oh, Dad, you better not trouble yourself. It's going to be too heavy for you. I mean, obviously, if I can pick up the 16-pound maul, I can pick up his plastic Fisher-Price axe. Some people think, yes, Jesus, you died for the sin of the whole world, but I don't know if you can save me. Really. If he can die for the sin of the whole world, he can save you if you are willing to be saved. So don't ever doubt the ability and the power of God. You know, I remember hearing a story one time about a lighthouse keeper in Ireland that uh, he had, of course, a lighthouse right on the coast. And on one side, he had the ocean. On the other side, there were some meadows where some sheep were grazing. And, and as his duties normally required, he went outside of the lighthouse up at the top to occasionally clean the windows. Lighthouses back then, they were fired by these kerosene lamps and they used to get soot so he was cleaning the window on the inside and then he went to the outside and there was a metal railing to protect him because it was you know 55 60 feet high and he didn't realize that uh, hadn't been painted properly and the railing had been rusting in the salt air he leaned against the railing and it broke and he toppled off and he fell next thing he knew he was staring up and he saw clouds and blue sky and he thought I must be in heaven because on his way down he thought I'm dead but then he thought, well, if I'm in heaven, then why does my back hurt so much? And he finally got his wits about him, and he stood up, and he realized he had landed on one of the sheep that was grazing below. And it had died, but it broke his fall. You know, God sent his son into the world to break our fall, to save us from the penalty of sin. But it cost him something. Something had to die to save us. And once we realize that it did cost, that our sin cost something, then it makes us sorry about sin and willing to turn from sin. Next question. Why was it necessary for Jesus to die? Well, first of all, we've all got this problem. Everybody in the world has sinned. You know, something went wrong in the DNA of Adam and Eve. Originally, God designed man where he naturally loved the natural automatic response of Adam and Eve was to love God and to love their fellow man. But with sin, they were infected with that selfish disease of the devil where all of a sudden they put themselves first. Even when God said to Adam, what have you done? He said, the woman made me do it. And then he talked to the woman. She said, the snake made me do it. Everybody was into self-preservation. And then the snake couldn't say anything, so he didn't have a leg to stand on. I think I've already used that one before. <laughs> but everyone sinned. We're all guilty. There is nobody, there's only one person who's lived in this world without sin. The Bible says Jesus did no sin. He is the Holy One of God. Everyone else has sinned. Now, why is that so bad? You've got to keep reading. You read in the Bible in Romans 6.23, the wages or the penalty for sin is death. And so um, the Bible tells us that it's a deadly disease. If a person is infected with sin, they're going to die. Now, just think for a moment. Imagine uh, you live on a Pacific island that's beautiful. And uh, on that island, you've got your family. You've got 10 children, but it's a very remote place. But it's a virtual paradise, and you're very happy. And you're enjoying life. And then some reason, one day, it's unexplainable. But one of the children you discover has come down with a deadly contagious disease. Now we're living in a time in our culture where we understand what separation means, what quarantine means. This disease is so virulent that you've got a choice. You know that if that child stays on the island, it's going to infect all the other children. But the problem with this disease is it causes a slow, painful death. And you've got to make a difficult decision. You either allow that child to stay and infect all the other children that you love and your wife and you all end up dying or you have to take that child and push it off on a raft where it's likely going to die from exposure. What do you do? It'd be a terrible decision to make. But God's got this planet 
that has this deadly disease and it's contagious and it causes pain and misery. Look at all the suffering in the world. And so we are somewhat insulated from the holy beings that God has in the cosmos. But uh, as a result of that, God sent Jesus in to create a bridge. He took our disease and he gives us his holiness. He died in our place. So we don't have to die because the penalty for sin is death. There are no exceptions. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. Something has to die. The Bible tells us that the life is in the blood. And, uh, you know, I remember seeing, uh, it was very sad, but it left a vivid impression on me. It was a snowy day in Maine. I was in school in Maine. And this, we were driving down a country road, and there was a truck up ahead of us, a friend and I. And uh, we saw this beautiful white dog ran out in front of the truck. It's like a big husky dog. And he slid on the ice. He normally probably would just bark at the tires and get away, but he slid on the ice and he couldn't get out of the way. And we saw the truck go over him. And uh, the thing I can't forget, we stopped and we got out and the dog was still alive and he looked up at us, but he had been badly cut and he was bleeding to death. And we watched, it, brokenhearted and helpless, as the blood ran out and the life ran out and there on the snow and I just could never forget that scene thinking about how the life is in the blood and um, Jesus when he paid his blood it's really saying he gave his life that we might be forgiven these are the ones this is a revelation seminar the whole gospel is there woven into the warp and the woof of all of revelation tells us these are the ones who have come out of great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Now that sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? How do you wash anything and make it white in blood? I cut myself shaving just before I came over. Had to do a lot of dabbing uh, before I came over because, you know, I thought, well, the last thing you want is, you know, red blood on a white collar or something like that. It stands out. How would you make something white by washing it in blood? I don't know. But the Bible says there's something different about the blood of Jesus. And I remember that, that uh, evangelist, I think it was Billy Sunday, he used to say, I don't understand how a black cow can eat green grass and make white milk and yellow butter, but I still enjoy it. <laughs> and so there, it's a mystery. But somehow the blood of Jesus washes our sins. The Bible says, though your sins are like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they will be like wool. And this is the promise in the power of the blood of Jesus. I remember an amazing fact I heard a few years ago. It's also very relevant today about William Pooley, who was a British nurse in Sierra Leone when the uh, Ebola pandemic broke out. And he, you know, a lot of people died from that disease and it, they had a very high mortality rate. And, uh, but he managed to recover, meaning that his blood had developed the antibodies that would help another person to recover. And he flew to the United States to share his blood with other people that were in critical condition, and it saved them. Another little amazing fact I'll throw in is, you've heard of yellow fever. Well, yellow fever, all the vaccine, and I've been to Africa, and they, I had to get the yellow fever vaccine before I went, and all of the yellow fever vaccine in the world comes from one native named Abbasi, who had the yellow fever, but he managed to survive it. And they took some of his blood and from the antibodies in his blood, they developed the vaccine and they multiplied it millions of times. But all of the vaccine came from that one man's blood. And anybody who will be in heaven will only be in heaven. There's people in the Old Testament, people in the New Testament, but anyone saved is saved by the blood of Jesus. Bible tells us in the book of Acts that there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. God is good. He loves people from all different backgrounds, but the only way to heaven is Jesus. And uh, the Bible tells us that um, it's through his sacrifice for us and faith in his blood, that's where we find pardon. People in the Old Testament were saved by looking forward to the cross. We are saved by faith, looking back to the cross, everybody is saved by faith in Christ and in the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. The Bible tells us Christ died for our sins. He stepped into our place. I remember I was in the Philippines a number of years ago and uh, 
I've been there three different times, but on this particular trip, they took us to a large prison that had about 10,000 inmates. And uh, I heard a story that, uh, I don't know if it was an urban legend or if it was true, but I, I'll share it with you, that there was uh, one man that was in the prison and he had a twin brother on the outside. His tw twin brother was a Christian. The one who was in prison, he was not a Christian, and they were identical twins. You would think they would both accept Christ together, but they didn't. The Christian got married, and once he got married, his other brother didn't find a wife, and he got discouraged. He started drinking. He was a jeepney driver. That's the local taxi. And he hit and killed some people while he was intoxicated, and he was put in prison for several years. Well, the prison there in the Philippines, this we saw with our own eyes. It wasn't like prisons where everyone had their own cell. It was almost like a village where people, they kind of went in and out of each other's huts and they would cook for themselves and kind of had a little city in there. And there were 10,000 men in this one prison. And this one man who was a Christian, um, he knew that his brother didn't know Jesus and that he needed he needed to be free, and he was becoming discouraged. And so he went to visit his brother, and he changed the visitor badge with his brother and changed clothes with his brother. He said, I will serve your time. You go free to show him the love of God. Well, this is what, I know that sounds radical, but this is what Jesus did. He said, look, I'm going to take your badness, and I'll give you my goodness. I'm going to take your sin. I'm going to give you my holiness. I will take your suffering so you don't have to suffer. I'll take your weakness, I'll give you my strength. He made a total exchange with us because of his love for us. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. He didn't deserve it. And that's why he could pay for our sins, because he was innocent. He was that pure, innocent lamb of God. So what is this great plan of salvation called in the Bible? You find it here in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse 6 having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth. You know, the gospel did not just begin in the New Testament. The gospel actually begins even in the Old Testament. The Bible tells us that Adam, he was saved by faith in the Lamb, as was Abraham, as was all of the patriarchs when they offered the sacrifice. They were saved by faith in God's mercy. That's the only thing that saves anyone. So why did God make such a fantastic sacrifice for us. Why would he do that? I think most of you know this verse. For God, and you hear, you can say this with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. We all know that. You know, I've read that verse many times and uh, the power of it never really stood out uh, in my mind as much as it did when uh, I heard a story. There was a minister and uh, he was reading the paper one morning and looking at the notices, he called his wife over. He said, look at this. This is just absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, a family in their community had bought their four-year-old boy a, a little red radio flyer wagon for his birthday. And the day of his birthday, when they got him the wagon, he was so excited to try it out. He hadn't learned about how to steer it got on their driveway, which sloped towards the street, ran it down the street, and the first time he went out into the street and it was hit and killed by a car. And uh, pastor saw that and he just broke his heart. And not long after he showed this to his wife, their phone rang. And the, I heard the pastor tell the story. And he said, uh, it was the family he had just read about. And they said, pastor, we wanted to know if you would be willing to have the funeral service for, for our family. And he said, of course. And then he said, at the funeral service, they had one child. This was their only child. And uh, there was the white casket up front. And the hardest thing for a pastor, I've done a few funerals where you've got the little white casket of a baby who dies from uh, sudden infant death syndrome or what we called crib death back then. It's just heartbreaking. And all of the, uh, after the service, you know, the, the mourners go by and they comfort the family. And the last ones to go by the casket is the family. And the mother got a hold of the casket and she wouldn't let go. And they couldn't pry her fingers off. And she kept wailing over and over and saying, we loved you so. We loved you so. And the pastor said, I could never read John 3.16 the same way. He said, just a two-letter word. 
but it says so much when you look at the broken heart that's behind it. God says, I love you so. And to think that we would say, we're going to turn from a God that loves us that much that he would give his son to save us and go back to a world of sin, it's incomprehensible. But this is what Jesus did for us. So what must I do to benefit from Jesus' sacrificial death? Is there some part that I play? Now, obviously, some are saved, some are lost. The Bible says, whosoever will come, they can be saved. We need to come to him. We must believe. The Bible tells us in Acts 16, 31, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You know, sometimes it, it sounds almost too good to be true. But believing isn't something you do just one time, but it starts with that one act of faith of saying, Lord, I'm going to choose to believe. And when you take that first step and you say, I'm going to come to Jesus, I remember when I did it, and, and I felt strange, and I've got all kinds of doubts, and the devil's going to try and frighten you, but you say, look, I've tried everything else. We're talking about life and death. We're talking about eternal life and eternal death. Then why would you want to gamble with eternity? I said, all right, Lord, I'm going to come to you. I believe a little bit. You're going to have to help me with the areas where I, I'm struggling. But you start with that first step of faith, and you come to him. And then he begins to strengthen your faith. And he transforms you. Uh, don't ever underestimate the power of faith. He says, you shall be saved. Salvation comes through faith. Jesus said to Nicodemus, we talked about this last night, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And it was the most amazing, most simple thing that happened there in the book of Numbers. They were all dying from the snake bite. Talked about this last night. And uh, Moses is told to make a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, probably something that resembled those fiery serpents that were biting them. And they were instructed, whoever looks will be healed from the venom that was killing them. And those who looked were healed. And some said, that's ridiculous. And they didn't look and they died. And there's so many in this world, the majority in the world, scoff at the plan of salvation. And they're going to die in their sins. The Bible tells us, there's only two groups. Unfortunately, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life and few take it. Broad is the gate and wide is the way that leads to destruction and many, the majority, go down that road. What's the difference between the few and the many? That look of faith, that look of believing. Jesus said, look in faith. He says, I will be lifted up. And on the cross, Christ said, look to me. I love you so much. I've died for you. I've given you an example of how to live. I've shown you what God is like and what his will is. Trust me, follow me, believe in me, and you'll be saved. And I should pause right here. What does the word believe mean? It means what it says. Be live. Believe doesn't mean just to think that there's a God, because James tells us even the devils believe and tremble. It means believe in Jesus is to be live in Jesus. All through the New Testament, Paul says, in Christ. He talks about letting the Lord in your heart and he lives out his life in you and you're in him. So you become one in spirit with God and you become a new creature. A, a, a new creation takes place in your life. As many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. You know, when we come to the Lord, he'll transform us and he gives us new power to be new creatures. So how then am I forgiven and cleansed? How does this actually transpire? Answer, Acts 3.19, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Now isn't that a wonderful promise? If we repent, our sins can be blotted out. doesn't matter how terrible your sins were. You can read in the Bible about David being guilty of murder. So was Moses actually. And adultery. David, not Moses. And uh, then you got King Manasseh uh, he was guilty of a whole gamut of terrible things, including killing prophets, sacrificing his own children. He repented. I still am amazed when I read it. He repented. He turned to God. He prayed. And God forgave him and brought him back to the kingdom. A wicked king like Manasseh, God could forgive. You're not a better sinner than God is a savior. The Bible says the arm of the Lord is not shortened so that he cannot save. God can reach you. He's got a very long arm. If you'll turn to him, 
but you must repent. Now, you don't hear a lot of sermons on this, but let me take a moment and talk about repentance. Uh, first thing that Jesus said when he started preaching he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist, exact same words. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Peter, in Acts chapter 2, when he started preaching, they said, what shall we do? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. What is repentance? Repentance is a sorrow for sin and a willingness to turn from sin. That doesn't mean that you'll be able to change everything instantaneously, but you ought to be willing to do his will. And if you're not, pray to be willing to be made willing. But just come with whatever you've got and say, Lord, here I am. I've got doubts. I've got struggles. I, I don't really want to change, but I know I need to change. Please change my heart so I do want to change. But you just come like you are, and he begins to transform you. The Bible tells us that uh, repentance means not only being sorry, but being willing to change. And uh, part of repentance is confession. Now, to the same degree you offend, to that degree you apologize. So like with our studio audience here tonight, if after the program on my, on my way out in my haste, I step on your toe, I'll probably say, excuse me, and you'll say no problem, right? Um, but if on my way out, I run by you and I knock you down the stairs and you got two broken bones and from the top of the stairs I say, excuse me, and I take off, that's not appropriate. <laughs> the offense is much more severe. The apology should be much more severe, much more intense, much more heartfelt. See what I'm saying? And so when someone comes to the Lord, I've seen it in many churches, and you know, I realize that God is merciful. He'll, he'll accept us coming uh, even though sometimes we don't understand the depth of what we're doing. Uh, the pastor will say, come forward, accept Jesus, say, Lord, I'm sorry for my sins. And, and they say, okay, you've repented. Ah, that's not, I don't think that's what repentance and confession is. It's a little more sincere than that, a little deeper than that. I mean, our sins have cost the life of God's son. How big a price is that? Think about what's the most valuable thing in the universe? You can't name a planet more valuable than the one who made the planet. So that would be God. And what would be the most valuable thing to God, his life or the life of his son? W which would hurt you more, your life or the life of your child? So God gave the most valuable gift that can be given to save you from your sins. So for you to say, oops, sorry God, thanks for eternal life, that's a little shallow. To the same depth that you repent, to that degree he can fill you. So here's what I recommend. When you get off by yourself, you can come to Jesus with a prayer. We'll be inviting you at the end of this presentation. But then when you get home, get by yourself. Repentance and confession. Get a list, piece of paper, and uh, you can do it on your computer, I suppose. That way you can press the delete button so nobody sees your list. And go through the Ten Commandments. You can't remember every sin you've ever committed, but... If you start with the categories like lying, you can put down, yeah, lying. Uh, murder, I've never murdered. Have you been angry with your brother without a cause? Oh, murder? <laughs> Adultery, I've never done that. Have you ever thought impure thoughts? Jesus said it begins with an attitude in the mind. You might write that down. Gossip, everybody can write that down, right? Write down the, your sins. And the Holy Spirit, he'll remind you. Pray that prayer with David. Lord, search me, try me, see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. He'll answer your prayer. So after you've made your list, show that to the Lord and say, Lord, I am repenting of my sins. These are my sins. You died for my wicked behavior and my sins. There's a lot of things that aren't on the list, Lord. And, uh, but I'm confessing I'm a sinner. But I believe that if I confess my sins, your word is true, that you are faithful and just to forgive me my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Thank you. Pray and thank him for doing it. Then press the delete button or burn that list. But you will find a relief in your soul because you've, you've really meant business with God. And you know what else happens? When you specifically write down your sins, you're saying, oh yeah, that is wrong. I got to stop. And if you say, Lord, please forgive me, for borrowing my neighbor's chainsaw and not taking it back. And God's going to say, I will forgive you, but you still have to take it back. 
So some people think I've just got to say I'm sorry. There might be some people you need to apologize to. There might be some letters you need to write. You stole from an employer, you might need to talk to your employer or make that right. I know that starts sounding pretty heavy. That doesn't mean you can go back in time and undo every wrong thing you've done. But you'd be surprised. The Holy Spirit might lay some things on your heart. This is what it means to repent and confess your sins. The world is hearing such a shallow concept of what it's all about. And then we come to the Lord. And he promises if we do that, he is faithful and just to cleanse us from our sins, to forgive us, and to cleanse us from how much unrighteousness? All if you're cleansed from all unrighteousness, then you have no more unrighteousness. You're righteous in his eyes. What is this wonderful conversion experience called? The Bible says you must be born again. And, you know, a few things are more delightful than, and it's amazing that people love them so much because they're a, <laughs> they're a little messy. But uh, babies are, are wonderful. Their eyes are so innocent and they're sparkling. I heard someone describe a baby once with a loud noise at one end and no responsibility at the other. But people love them so much and mothers will lay down their lives to save them. And part of the thing that, that attracts us is their innocence. That they're, they're, they're hungry, they're trusting in their parents. Jesus said, unless you're converted and you become as a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. He wants us to have that simple childlike faith that he will provide everything that we need. Who enters the heart of each born again Christian? Answer, even the spirit of truth. You know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. And Jesus was speaking these words. Jesus said, it's important that I go away. If I go, I will come again. But if I go, I'll also send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. And it's not an it. It's a he. Christ tells us that he is in us through the person of the Holy Spirit. And so we'll sense his presence. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. When Jesus lives in my heart through the Holy Spirit, what will I do? How will things be different? Well, there's several things. First of all, it says both to will and to do of his good pleasure. We'll be willing to do his will. What is the will of God? Well, you can read in Psalms 40, verse 8, Yea, Lord, I love to do your will. Your law is in my heart. And this is what the new covenant is all about. God takes his law and writes it in our heart. And the Holy Spirit will guide us and we'll be willing to do his will. Doesn't mean there's never going to be a struggle. The Bible tells us Jesus went through a real struggle in the Garden of Gethsemane. Why should I be confident that my new birth experience will be successful? The Bible promises he that has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us he is the author and the finisher of our faith. Now a lot of people at this point get discouraged. They say, I started out as a Christian, but after a few years, you know, I had those sins that bothered me. Now I still have the sins, but they don't bother me. And I'm beginning to wonder where that first love went. And they start thinking, will I ever make it? Well, you don't want to ever in your Christian life get to the point where you're comfortable with sin. That's when you start, your heart gets a callus on it. It's like the person that lives by the train track they don't even hear the train anymore i've got some friends that they, they live at the runway end or the approach path of an airport and you'll be talking to them the whole house will shake and the jet roars over and i say how do you live with that and they go live with what <laughs> and uh, it's sad you see some people they've been christians for years and they never got past the baby stage now when you're a baby babies crawl babies fall they are, they they don't always get the food in their mouth. They have some problems, but you know what? What does a baby do to grow? It eats, it breathes, it rests, and it needs a regular cleansing. And if you come to the Lord, if you're a newborn baby, don't be discouraged. Just keep feeding your soul on the Word of God, breathing, prayer. This is the Holy Spirit. You got to exercise your little limbs. You see the little babies, are, you know, pretty soon they're crawling around. They got the combat crawl and then they're up and then they're up on two feet and it's fun to watch them grow. But it's really sad when someone's been in the church for uh, 20, 30 years and they're still crawling and there's, it's all milk. God wants Christians to mature and to grow. If you worry about your progress, don't be discouraged. Continue to come to the Lord, repent 
and trust that as long as you continue to come to him, sometimes it's two steps forward and it's one step back. And even in my own life, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but I press on forgetting those things that are behind. It's like someone said once, uh, I'm not what I ought to be, but I praise God I'm not what I used to be. <laughs> and so you just trust that he's going to finish that work as you continue walking with him. He that has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You know, I remember uh, people think about, well, Pastor Doug, works, you know, doing the Christian works is so difficult. And I remember hearing that this lady years ago, she married a gentleman. She was too young. He was a little bit older than her, but he was a military man, and he looked so sharp and, and uh, dashing in his uniform that she just got swooned. After she married him, she realized she'd make a terrible mistake because he was a, a really r cruel husband. <laughs> and it was, not that he beat her or anything, but he just ran the home like it was a military installation. He even gave her a list every day of what her chores were. And uh, he, he'd hand her a list, and it would say for day-to-day -day stuff like, you know, wake up, 5.30, build the fire, pack my lunch, cook me breakfast, clean this, clean that, pack that, arrange this, and had her day all mapped out. And uh, she was faithful to the commitment of marriage, and after several years, he died. And uh, she wasn't all that sorry. A couple of years later, she met another gentleman, married him, very different. Loving, considerate, loved her, she knew he loved her, and uh, after several years of happy marriage, she was cleaning out the attic one day, and she found one of her first husband's lists and as soon as she saw it, the hair stood up on the back of her neck. She saw the audacity of that man telling me, wake up 5.30. And she said, well, I still wake up 5.30. Build the fire. Yeah, I still build the fire. Cook breakfast. I do unpack lunch. You know, la launder the clothes. Yeah, I do, I do. She went through the list. She said, well, look at that. I'm doing everything on my first husband's list. And it doesn't bother me at all. Because she loved the one she was doing it for. Amen. Some people... They see the Bible and the law of God as, as a list of rules. But when you love the person, then it's actually a delight. And uh, you don't have to be concerned about that. Number 11, why do some people fail in their Christian experience? We've turned everyone to his own way. And this is where the biggest struggle is in living the Christian life. The Bible tells us that Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed that prayer. We all need to pray, not my will, but your will be done. Uh, every day, we need to pray that prayer. And it's often a struggle. You're, as long as you're in this life, in your body, you're going to feel a battle. The Bible tells us, Paul says, there's a struggle between the spirit and the flesh. Uh, Peter and James, it says, they're at war with each other. We've got our selfish, carnal natures, and then you've got the spiritual nature that is led by God and his will. And it's a constant effort in the Christian life to subdue that. It does require effort to be a Christian. It costs something, but I tell you, it pays a lot more than it costs. It's a lot better than the guilt and the shame of being a slave to the devil. There are struggles in the wilderness on the way to the promised land, but you've got hope, you've got purpose, and God is with you. It's a lot better than being a slave for the Pharaoh back there in Egypt. Be mindful of the commandments of us, the apostles, of the Lord and Savior. So it's being willing to read the word on a regular basis and to be mindful of it. That means be willing to follow his word and his will. So how can I know that Jesus accepts me and that I'm his child? Well, a very simple thing here. It says that God's promised and God can't lie. You've heard that expression. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. God is never going to tell you something and go back on his word. His Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. He's made us a promise. He is more interested in saving you than you probably are in being saved. He wants you to be saved, and he's not going to lie. The Bible says, ask, and it will be given to you. Don't be afraid to pray, and pray big prayers. I can think of so many times in my life I prayed some just extraordinary prayers. I remember once I was, I was uh, driving cross-country, and I picked up, I, I was falling asleep. And I said, oh, Lord, if I had someone to just talk to, I'd stay awake, and I needed to keep going. And right after I prayed, I'm out in the middle of the desert. 
And I thought, I'm going to pull off at this off-ramp so I can rest. I mean, it was the middle of the desert between Phoenix and Los Angeles, California, and there was nothing but an overpass. I thought, well, if I, I, I've got to talk to someone or I've got to take a nap. So I pulled over to find some shade under the overpass, and as I pulled off, there was a guy standing there hitchhiking out in the middle of the desert. He couldn't go on the freeway because that was illegal. And I thought, well, that's a miracle. I even pulled over. So I pulled up to see if he needed a ride. He said, oh, praise the Lord. He said, a farmer left me off here, and I thought I was going to die out here. So he got in my car, and we drove along, and he saw the Bible up on the dashboard. He said, are you a Christian? I said, yeah, I'm a Christian. Matter of fact, I just prayed I could have somebody to talk to. And, and he said, oh, well, I was just in, he said, I got out of jail. He said, while I was in jail, I was reading this book called Bible Readings for the Home, and I got so many questions about the Bible. I said, really? I said, well, and boy, I woke right up. I stayed awake until L.A., talking to him. He told me the most amazing story. He said, I was standing on the road not long before you picked me up. He says, I know there must be a God because I said, God, if you're there, he said, I'm hungry. I need something to eat. And I said, I prayed that prayer. I'm out in the desert in the middle of nowhere. He said, and a truck went by carrying oranges from Southern California. It hit a bump. Three oranges bounced out. <laughs> and he said, I know there's a God. And friends, I've heard so many prayers like that being answered. He will answer your prayers. Ask Number 13, how will true conversion change a life? Now, we've got several examples here. We're going to go through some of these. First of all, it says, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. You know, there'll be genuine love in our heart. God starts changing our attitudes towards others. The Holy Spirit brings love into families. It'll bring love into a workplace and uh, and you should see that kind of love also even in a church family. If you have love for one another, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. There's a metamorphosis that takes place just like the worm developing wings. It's a miracle that uh, evolutionists cannot explain. But uh, how this crawling, fat little creature can all of a sudden become a delicate winged creature is what he does for us. He makes us a new creature. Old things are passed away all things have become new. There should be a change. Some people used to have bumper stickers and it said, uh, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. And while I agree that Christians may not be perfect, they are more than just forgiven. I think that when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, that there's going to be a transformation. You become a new creature. Your desires change. Your goals change. See? It says, we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. We want to know what pleases the Lord, and we seek to obey Him. D, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I should take a moment and talk about that. You are who you are because of what you eat mentally and physically, physically and mentally. You'll be shaped by what you read, what you listen to, what you watch. And it's so important as a Christian, you become like who you look at. Your soul is like a photographic plate. And if you keep looking at the things of the world, you're going to act worldly. You keep looking at sin, that's what's going to be in your mind. But if you fix your eyes on Jesus, the Bible says we are transformed by beholding him, 2 Corinthians. So as we're looking at the Lord, something changes inside. And we're going to find we want to do his will. It says that we might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And then he says, we'll be his witnesses. We're going to want to live a life that's going to let that light shine so that people will be attracted to Christianity. I remember hearing a story once that uh, uh, up in the uh, Black Hills, they had discovered some gold. And these three gold miners, when they found the gold, they said, look, we got to go get supplies so we can build a real mine. And uh, let's just vow before God, when we go to town, we're going to quietly get our supplies We'll meet up outside of town. We'll head back to the claim. Don't tell anybody, because there were people that were combing the hills back then looking for gold. They had discovered gold back at that time. So they all went. They got the supplies, and they tried to hide it and be as secretive and careful as they could. And when they gathered together outside of town and started, they noticed there was a gang of people following them. They said, what are you doing? They said, we're following you. Why are you following us? You guys found gold. Did you say anything? I didn't say anything. You say anything? What makes you think we found gold? They said, it's all over your face. <laughs> they were shining. 
They couldn't hide the joy. And if you're a Christian, you ought to have that light inside so that we're witnesses for him. If praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, not only do we have regular times when we should be kneeling in prayer and devotions for God and talking to him in maybe a more formal way, Every morning when I get up, I go to my office, I kneel and I talk to the Lord, and sometimes several times a day, but I do it without ceasing, meaning I try to maintain a, an ongoing conversation with God through the day, in my car, whenever I'm by myself, sometimes even when I'm talking to other people, I'm talking to God, praying about what to say. And so you just walk in the Spirit with God. Number 14, what wonderful promises come with the Christian life? There's some Beautiful things here that will outline. A, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Please keep in mind, friends, God is never going to ask you to do something without giving you the power to do it. The Bible tells us that in every command of God inherently is the power to do what he wants you to do. If God says, I want you to walk across that ocean, he will either help you walk on water or he will part the sea or he will move mountains. Don't say, oh, Lord, I can't. The word of God is enabling. When God commands us to do something, he will help you do it. You take those first steps of faith and you will see miracles happen all through your life. God will supply all of your needs. You know, Jesus sent out the apostles preaching and teaching. He said, I want to teach you faith. When you go, don't take your credit cards. I'm paraphrasing. He said, don't take a money purse with you. He said, don't take a walking stick. Don't take extra garments. He said, watch and see if I don't supply all of your needs. I remember one time I was traveling, travel a lot, and uh, when I got to the hotel, I discovered I had forgot my phone charger and I was going to be away from town for two or three days at this hotel and I thought, oh no, phone's going to die. Don't even know how to use a regular telephone anymore. All my numbers are in my phone. My schedule's in my phone. I need everything in my phone. I said, oh Lord, I said, well, I don't know what to do. I'm going to pray. It's late at night at the hotel and I have no charger. And my phone was a unique model. Back then, every phone seemed to have a different charger. I knelt down and I prayed and said, Lord, don't know what I'm going to do about this. Battery's almost dead after my flight. And I said, I, I, need, I need a charger. And I said, amen. I felt that he heard my prayer. I opened my eyes. And there, by the bed, in the outlet, was a phone charger. And I said, no, it can't be. Is it a Motorola? And I pulled it out, and it was the very phone charger I needed, which I borrowed from whoever left it there until I checked out. <laughs> I gave it to the front desk and it was able to charge my phone. But he supplies our needs. I've had many, many miracles like this and he will do that for you. With God, all things are possible. Don't ever doubt the, the power of God. And he wants our joy to be full. Christianity should be a happy religion. The gospel is good news. The Bible tells us that um, uh, they, they we're on our way to a feast, not to a funeral. So many people look like they're baptized in pickle juice. Christianity should be happy. It should be joyful. And uh, as someone said once that, you know, if Christ is in your heart, then you need to have your heart notify your face because it's good news. There should be joy in our lives. That they might have life and have life more abundantly. The Lord wants you to have an abundant, full life now, but it's also eternal life in the world to come. And if we are good witnesses for the Lord, and if we've got that joy, um, we'll be sharing that with others. We won't be able to keep it to ourselves. Jesus has promised, I will never leave thee and forsake thee. It's so wonderful to know that God is with us everywhere we go. And he says, do not fear what man might do to you. You know, Jesus said, there are people that will make fun of you and you might be persecuted. He said, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. You have nothing to fear because if God is with you, he'll take care of everything. And finally, he promises, my peace I give unto you, not like the world, but he gives us a peace that passes all understanding. And he paid such an incredible price that we might enjoy that peace. Why would God pay so much for you to have a new heart, a new life, and live with him forever if it wasn't possible for you to have that experience. Friends, he wants you to have that experience. Now, years ago in 1937, there was a man named John uh, Griffin who was given the, he lost his money in the stock market in Oklahoma, and then he moved to Mississippi, and he ended up getting a job as a, uh, a keeper 
on a bridge. And this is one of those uh, trestles. It was a railroad bridge that went across the Mississippi where a section of the bridge would rise when the ships came through and then it would lower again. And one day he brought his son, Greg, eight years old, to work with him. Wanted to see where dad worked. His, the father's job was sometimes very boring. He'd sit there and wait for hours until a boat came. He'd raise up the trestle and then he'd put it down again right away because they had trains that would go speeding across the track. And uh, every now and then he'd get a signal in his booth and they'd say that a train is coming. Is the bridge going to be down? And he would signal and they'd go by the signal, that green light, full speed ahead. Well, one day when his son was there watching how dad worked and his, his son was very antsy and running around and getting into everything, he saw that a boat was coming down. And so he raised up the trestle and he waited and he saw the ship was on its way down and then he heard the Memphis special gave the signal that it was on its way and they wanted to know will the bridge be down he said yeah no problem and he started the bridge going down he gave the signal for the train to go full speed ahead and as the gears began to go and lower the machine he looked in horror down his son had wandered out into the machinery and a piece of cable with a fray on it had caught his clothing and was pulling him up into the gears. And the father only had an instant to make a very difficult decision. If he stopped the bridge, it was too late to stop the train that had hundreds of people on it. It would smash into the trestle and cars and people would go spilling off into the river and no doubt many would die. Uh, if he didn't stop it, his son would die. And it didn't take him long. He realized that he needed to save the people on the train. And so with his heart breaking, he shouted to his son. He said, I love you, Greg. But he knew he couldn't stop him. And he was pulled into the machinery and killed. And the bridge went down. And the Memphis special went speeding by. And they saw the man that was there in the glass booth by the tower. And they waved at John. And they didn't realize what he had paid just then so that they could live. And you, know, you wonder sometimes, all these people in the world are sort of speeding on their way, and we don't know how much Jesus has paid that we might live. The question is, are you willing to accept that gift? He loved you so much, he gave his son, but you need to make a decision. You know, some of you are part of host groups, and we're going to invite you to respond tonight. I'd like to walk you through some simple questions. Here in our studio audience, we've got these cards as well. You know, the best time to listen to God's will is when you're hearing it. The best time to listen to his voice is when he's speaking to you. I'd like to invite you to make a decision right now. That first step of faith can begin now. The devil will want you to postpone it. Make it now and God can give you a new heart. First of all, I'm going to ask you a series of five questions. I believe that salvation comes only by grace through faith in Jesus. You can check yes. Now, some of you... You may not have your cards in front of you. You will find the card at the revelation.com, uh, revelationnow.com website. Don't go there yet because in order to do that, you might have to sign off the stream if you're streaming. But you can do that during our break. You'll find these cards there. Question number two, I want to repent of my sins and surrender my life to Jesus. Make that decision now. Mark that. And we'd like to know how to pray for you and with you. And you see these questions up on your screen as well. Question three, and I expect there are many in this category. I once followed Jesus, but I've drifted away, and now I want to recommit my life to him. You can get a new beginning and experience that new birth. Find your first love, friends. You can do that now by asking. Maybe you'd like special prayer as you make this commitment or pray about the commitment. Check that box. We have a group that will be praying for you. And we're offering more information. You know, once a baby's born, they need to feed. And we would like to provide material to help you learn more about Jesus. If you're in a group or a church, we know over a thousand churches have registered, please fill out your name on your card and give it to your group leaders. And those of you who are going to do this online, we encourage you, if you don't have a card with you, go to the website during the break, fill out your card, and that will communicate with us so we can rejoice with you and tell you how to begin your new life with Jesus. Let me pray with you before we go to our Bible questions. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, I believe we've heard the gospel tonight. And I think that there's some people out there that feel the Holy Spirit speaking to their hearts and they want to make that decision. 
Lord, encourage them right now to have the courage and the faith to respond to your love that you're desperate to save them by coming to Jesus, by praying in their hearts and accepting him as their Savior, by taking those first steps where they begin a new life in Christ. Bless each one and pour out your spirit on this series. We thank you and ask in Christ's name. Amen. Now, we'll be back in two minutes with uh, some Bible questions. You can still send them in. You may want to go to revelationnow.com, fill out your card and send it to Pastor Doug or your group leader so we can know how to pray for you. Be right back. I was addicted to all different types of things. I was drinking so much on the road that when I got home, I would be just yelling at the top of my lungs. I had a problem with authority, started smoking at the age of 14 and drinking by the age of 15. I had money, I had women, I had a car every two years. Life wasn't really that fulfilling. I mean, I was having a great time on the outside, but inside I knew something was dying, something was wrong. I got down on my knees and I prayed to God. And I said, God, if you're there, wherever you lead me in life, whatever you want me to do, I am yours. I had uh, started studying the Bible and found amazing facts online and was watching hours of sermons each day. My life has changed so much since I started following God's path for me. I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. From the bottom of my heart. really started getting involved with crime, break and enters, selling drugs, stealing cars. All of us were high, drugs all over the car, paraphernalia, pipes. I was suicidal, I was developing an eating disorder, so like all these things were just coming into play. One night, I was um, flicking through my channels in my dorm. There was this guy, this preacher. By the end of the program, I had a complete understanding of what God's plan actually is. I started going through these Amazing Facts study guides, and I finished those. And I, I was so hungry, I couldn't put them down. This series helped me to see how reasonable God is. So after doing the studies and learning the truths that I had been learning, I decided to take that next step. I thank God for ministries like Amazing Facts. To a great extent, the reason why I am in the church today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for changing my life. I'd like to welcome everybody back to uh, Revelation Now, and thank you for sending in all of your great Bible questions. And we're going to take the next 20 minutes or so, try and answer as many of these Bible questions as possible. So, uh, Pastor Doug, are you ready? We'll see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we have our first question that we'll take. It says, if I accept Christ and His forgiveness, but then I fall again, will He forgive me again? Well, you see several examples in the Bible where people like, Peter and Mary Magdalene. The Bible tells us that uh, Mary Magdalene, out of whom Jesus cast seven devils. And the way that's rendered, it's, it's really not at one time, but she continued to fall mm -hmm. into her old habits. And uh, Peter, more than once, he denied Jesus three times, but more than once, uh, Peter backslid. He was also kind of rebuked by Paul later with, in his letter to the Galatians. So um, God's very merciful. You can see in David's life, there was not only that incident with Bathsheba. There were times where David was being deceptive uh, when he numbered Israel because of pride. And, you know, if we make mistakes, once, once we come to Christ, he adopts you, you become his child. God does not unadopt you. Mm. Uh, if you repent of your sins and you turn back to him, he's merciful. First John, chapter, first John 1 verse 9 says, yeah. if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to yes. cleanse us. And Claim that promise. Our next question that we have is, uh, is there anything I can do to help God save me? Well, that's what you could call a loaded question. It, you you want to be careful not to communicate that we are helping God out because mm -hmm. um, God's provided everything we need to be saved uh, in the sacrifice of Jesus. But is there something we must do to cooperate? The answer is yes. First of all, uh, you come to the Lord in faith. He saves you right away. But we must cooperate, b being willing to believe. Jesus says, this is the work, that you believe on the one whom God has sent. But in addition, then, if we're going to grow 
in our faith. So being saved is an event of justification. That means it can happen in a moment when you come to Christ. We hope some of you are experiencing that right now. You made a decision. You've prayed and turned your life over to the Lord. That can be the turning point. But now there's growth that happens through reading the word. We need to feed our souls. We need to spend time in prayer and then tell other people, you know, exercise our faith. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we'll continue to grow. Okay. Uh, we have another question that we'll put up on the screen. Uh, how can I even approach God in my sinful condition? You know, that's the wonderful thing uh, about the plan of salvation is you see story after story in the Bible. Even Peter, he fell down at Jesus' feet. I think this is Luke chapter 5. And uh, Peter was amazed because Jesus had filled his nets to bursting. And he realized this was a supernatural miracle. He had lived on the sea all his life and never saw a catch like this. And he suddenly had a, a sense of the holiness of Christ. And Peter fell at Jesus' feet and he said, Lord, depart from me. I am a sinful man. Jesus said, don't be afraid. And he says, from now on, you'll catch men. Hmm. And one time a leper came to Jesus and the Bible says he was full of leprosy. And this is like a person who's full of sin. You know, I, I love hearing the stories from uh, uh, Salvation Army. And I used to listen to these radio testimonies from Pacific Garden Mission about people who their lives were just, you know, totally uh, out in the world, you know, in the gutter, drugs, uh, you know, alcoholism, just they seemed like they're totally captive of the enemy. Radical change. Mm. And, uh, you know, even in Amazing Facts, we got a, a few people that were behind bars, and now right. they're serving the Lord, you know. And preaching and teaching. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, Pastor Doug, we've got a question or two coming in, and uh, again, thank you for your questions. Uh, here's one that I like. It says, why does the Bible describe God and Satan both as a lion? Yeah, well, I think that it's the characteristic. Um, you know, w the Lord is often described in a number of ways. You know, one time God is described as an eagle. Well, an eagle is an unclean bird. <laughs> so, you know, you, you can eat a quail and a dove. Why would you describe Jesus as a dove and an eagle? An eagle eats a dove. Well, it's just saying that God has that perspective, the eagle's the strength and the power. And he says, I bore you on my wings like eagles. But then uh, the characteristics of a lion says, your adversary like a lion. It's lion-like the way Satan roves and stalks yeah. his prey. But the lion is also a powerful, majestic beast. And so that's why Jesus is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. And so it's talking about the majesty of Christ. You know, Pastor Doug, when I read that question, I thought of another sort of parallel symbol uh, Jesus says, speaking of the devil, I saw him fall like lightning from heaven. And then Jesus, when talking about the second coming, he says, as lightning that shines from the east to the west, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So yeah. you've got a lion representing Christ, and lion, symbol for Satan. You've got a lightning, can describe Christ, can describe Satan. The serpent is a symbol of the devil, a symbol of sin. But the Bible tells us Christ became sin for us who knew yeah, no sin, that we right. might be made the righteous. So some interesting parallels. That yeah, we it's see the throughout attributes the Bible. of those symbols or creatures that you might find some similarities mm -hmm. in both characters. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we've got a question that uh, I assume came from a child. And the question is, I'd like to know, is it possible for a child to commit the unpardonable sin? Well, if the child is living before the age of accountability, I'd say, no, it's impossible. Because... Um, you're before that age. Now, someone may send in a question and say, what is that age? I'll preempt that now by uh, trying to explain that there's no specific age given in the Bible. Probably the closest you can come is to say that, you know, when Jesus was 12 years old, that's when it was customary for Jews to bring their, their boys to the temple. They saw that they were transitioning, you know, and even biologically, there's a transition that happens uh, from child to adult. And th they start understanding the consequences of sin and salvation. And when a child's old enough to comprehend those things, and different children mature at different ages, and, and even girls may sometimes mature spiritually before boys. I, I think I've seen that. Um, that's when that uh, time where they start becoming accountable for those decisions. I don't think you're going to see too many teenagers that have grieved away the Holy Spirit because God is so patient. It mm -hmm. usually takes years for a person to get mm -hmm. to that point harden their hearts like that. If somebody is wondering about that, that's probably evidence that the Holy Spirit is still speaking to their heart. And we, I think and we've got hope. a free book they can read on that. Yes. Was, was the unpardonable sin? 
right? And that's available at the website, mm -hmm. the Amazing Facts website. Uh, another question that we have is, um, is belief and faith the same thing? You said that the devil believes and he's not saved. Well, belief and faith, uh, belief and saving faith are not the same thing. You know, you can, uh, you can have a, a, a faith where you say, I acknowledge, I assent that Jesus is real. Mm -hmm. The devil knows that. And the devil will even admit that God loves us. But it's not a belief where he's believing what is said. He's not responding to it. If I say, you know, a tornado is about to hit our studio here in uh, 30 seconds. And everyone says, yes, I, we believe you, Pastor Doug. And you sit there, you don't believe me. <laughs> so uh, there's a belief then that says uh, you, you respond. Mm -hmm. And so that's the nuance of difference I would see in the two. Okay, uh, another question. It says, uh, why don't we see the miracles that we read about back in the Bible? You know, when I hear this question, I think about the story of Gideon. And in Judges chapter 6, the Bible tells, and keep in mind, Judges dates back long before Elijah, long before the days of Jesus. An angel appears to Gideon, and Gideon says, whatever happened to all the miracles we used to hear about? We haven't seen any of those miracles like when the children of Israel came out of Egypt or when they crossed the Jordan. What, whatever happened to the days of miracles? Are they all gone? And I, you laugh looking back now and think, wow, Gideon saw some pretty big miracles mm -hmm. in his life. And then, of course, you hadn't even seen Elijah, the fire coming down from heaven, or all the miracles of Elisha, and then all the miracles of Jesus. Miracles seem to come in waves in the Bible. And they did during the time of Christ and the apostles. I believe we're going to see waves of mir and I believe miracles are happening in the world today. I've seen things that I would describe, people might argue, but I'd describe them as miracles. And uh, sitting in this studio is a miracle <laughs> <laughs> right now. We know. Uh, we don't have time for that story though. But uh, so I think that we're going to see more miracles, uh, especially when persecution increases, when the proclamation of the gospel becomes more challenged, God begins to act more mm -hmm. as God's people start to live, out, live out real Christianity, you see more real miracles. Okay, another question is coming from uh, Ginger. She asks, you mentioned yesterday that Moses was resurrected after three days. Is that in the Bible? Well, the three days part is not in the Bible. It does tell you that Moses was resurrected because if you look in Mark chapter nine, it tells you, and also as well as Luke and Matthew, tells you that uh, Christ, uh, or Moses appeared to Jesus on what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus hiked up this mountain with Peter, James, and John, and Elijah and Moses appeared to him. There is a Jewish uh, tradition. It's not part of the Bible, but it's called the Assumption of Moses. And it says that three days after Moses' death, he was raised. And we believe that they have no reason to doubt that it was three days. But no, specifically, that's not in the Bible, but it does say Moses. And you do have in Jude verse 9, where it says that mm -hmm. when Michael came, uh, he didn't, dispute with the devil regarding the body of Moses but said the Lord rebuked thee. So also you've got that verse in Jude verse 9. It talks about the resurrection of Moses. We've got a question from Karen. She's asking, uh, is a picture of Jesus a, um, considered a graven image and forbidden in the commandments? It could be. Now this is a, something that people need to be careful not to confuse. God does not say in the Ten Commandments, do not make any graven image and stop. You got to keep reading. It says, do not make a graven image the likeness of anything in the heaven above, the water beneath uh, the earth. Do not bow down yourself to them or serve them. There was no inherent sin in the people making uh, some facsimile of a flower. Matter of fact, when they were building the temple, uh, God told Moses to carve two angels and put them on the Ark of the Covenant. They weren't to pray to them. God told Moses to make a bronze serpent. And the people were to look and to live. But later when they started praying to that serpent, Hezekiah said, no, yeah, that's idolatry. He crushed it. And uh, in the temple of Solomon, uh, they had calves that were built underneath the labor to hold it in place. And they made additional angels and they made images of pomegranates and <laughs> different things. So uh, making some artistic work was not a sin. But I have seen people pray to pictures and I have seen people pray to statues and that's when it turns into idolatry. Okay, well here we have an interesting question. It says, if the devil knows the Bible, why would he stick to the plan that's revealed in Revelation? And some people worship their cars too. 
You can make an idol out of your car. I'm still thinking about that last question. Sorry. You know, what, what was that question again? Sorry. All right, here we go again. It says, if the devil knows the Bible, why would he stick to the plan revealed in Revelation? You know, it says that he knows he has a short time. So, yes, I think the devil, he, he knows, uh, he, you know, hope springs eternal, I guess, even with the devil. He's, he's got this uh, delusional idea that mm -hmm. maybe if he fights the bitter end, something will change. And if nothing else, he's trying to keep that, that belief alive among his demons. Right. And even in the very last battle, when he launches his final assault on the people of God, you think, isn't it crazy to think you can fight against God? But um, he had deceived himself into thinking that he had a fighting chance. Mm -hmm. Another place, though, and I think it's Revelation 12, he says he, he, he's come down with great wrath because he knows his time is short. Mm -hmm. I think the devil knows his days are numbered. Okay, very good. Um, how can I tell whether or not my prayers are actually answered? Well, if you say, Lord, uh, you know, I'm hungry and <laughs> bless me with food and he miraculously provides food, that's an answer to prayer. So I don't know if I'm, uh, I think usually there's evidence. Okay. So sometimes prayers, let's just say you're praying for the salvation of someone you love. How do you know that prayer is going to be answered? I think you have faith and you continue to pray and you store and compound those prayers in heaven. Um, you know, many times we pray for people's healing. You and I have mm -hmm. done anoint anointings for people and we have seen miraculous dramatic healings. People that had cancer and the, the tumors went away and uh, just wonderful things. Sometimes when you pray for healing, you know that prayer is going to be answered in the resurrection when they get a glorified body. Uh, so, you know, we have to trust that God answers our prayers the way he sees best. And those, that may vary from time to time. Okay. Somebody's asking, how do you stop thinking about the guilt of your past? You've prayed, you've asked God to forgive you, but it seems like these things keep coming back into your mind. Very good, very important question. And I struggle with that like everyone else. You know, you've got these brain cells that still have the memories of the terrible things you did and your regrets. And even after I've asked the Lord to forgive me a thousand times for something, uh, it'll pop back into my mind. I'll think, oh, Doug, what were you thinking? And then I'll say, oh, Lord, that's a devil trying to make me feel bad. I, you forgave me for that a long time ago. And uh, I just remind myself of that. I think Martin Luther put it this way. He said, you cannot prevent the birds from flying over your head, but you can prevent them from making a nest in your hair. I always feel funny quoting that because the birds can't make a nest in my hair. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it means basically that you, those thoughts will come. And I think the, the more we train ourselves when the devil brings it back to make us feel guilty, say, thank you, Lord, for forgiving me. And you know what? Those memories, that pain, it, it gets more dull. It doesn't hurt mm -hmm. as much. Mm -hmm. He heals it. Okay, here's a good question. It says, Pastor Doug, do you have some tips that'll help me in my prayer? Yeah. Um, well, the Bible tells us, pray in faith. So believe that God hears you. Uh, some people struggle keeping focused when they're mm -hmm. praying. Mm -hmm. And uh, that actually is just a discipline that takes time. I remember reading how David Livingston, he used to, uh, learned to read his Bible and pray when he was manning a cotton gin there in Scotland. And it was very loud and very distracting, but he learned to focus, and he had to train himself. So later that came in ha very handy in Africa, um, where uh, he said sometimes the drums would go all night long. Hmm. And he could continue to pray, he could continue to read his Bible and focus. And so when your mind wanders, bring it back. If it wanders, say, Lord, forgive me, bring it back. Um, and start, you know, your prayers may not be, we sing that song, Sweet Hour of Prayer. They may not be an hour to start with. Start praying little prayers, and then you'll mature in your prayer. And tell God what's on your heart. Don't worry about a certain formula. Nothing wrong with reading out of a prayer book, but you really want real prayer is the cry of your heart to God. And the Holy Spirit, uh, the Bible promises the Holy Spirit will take our prayers and make them eloquent to God. Mm -hmm. uh, another question that we have <laughs> is, um, is rebaptism rebaptism necessary? Well, good question. Uh, there are probably three Bible reasons where it might be necessary to be rebaptized. One, if you were not baptized biblically, meaning uh, bibl bibl the biblical method for baptism is immersion, mm -hmm. and that's where a person is, you know, immersed and brought up like Jesus was. You might want to be baptized biblically, so that's one reason, or you might call that a rebaptism. Second reason would be is if um, 
If you've backslidden in a major way and, and divorced yourself from the Lord, you stopped going to church. Now, if, if you've sinned, well, God's arranged where during the communion service you can get a new beginning. But um, sort of like a mini baptism with foot washing. But uh, if you stop going to church, you kind of turned your back on the Lord and uh, when you return, you may consider rebaptism. And mm -hmm. I'm not talking about you miss a few weeks of church. This is something serious. It's like marriage. If you're legally divorced, you need to get legally remarried. Right. Um, and then third reason is, in Acts 19, it describes some people who they, um, they heard Paul preaching. There were 12 Ephesian believers and... Um, they had not heard about Jesus. They had been baptized biblically by John the Baptist, but they hadn't heard about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the ministry of Christ. They had left before all that happened. Paul preached all these things to them and rebaptized them because there was so much new truth that they really thought, boy, I need a whole new beginning. I just, there's so much I didn't know. And some may even think about rebaptism after this seminar because you're going to learn a lot of stuff in the 16 more nights. Then okay. we have to go. <laughs> Very good. Uh, bringing that up, Pastor Doug, we just want to remind folks who are joining us, if this is the first time that you joined us, this is part of a series of presentations dealing with different Bible prophecies. We will continue tomorrow evening. Mm -hmm. And the topic tomorrow evening is the unchangeable law. Yes. So, you know, if we talk about laws changing, it seems, every day, different places, different states. But there is a law that doesn't change. And, of course, that's going to be the subject tomorrow. And we've got to know that in Revelation because the beast has got a law. And God has a law, and you'll see that mentioned several times in Revelation, so you don't want to miss that study. Yes, so that's tomorrow evening, and uh, of course it will be live. Uh, we want to remind you of our free gift for today. It is a book entitled, Is It Easy to Be Saved or to Be Lost? And we'll be happy to send this to anyone who would like it. All you have to do is uh, text the word CHOICE to the number 40544 and you'll be able to receive a digital copy of this book. It's a great read, especially dealing with the subject that we spoke about. If you're outside of North America, you can go to the Revelation Now website and click on the free offers, and you can download the book, uh, Is It Easier to Be Saved or to Be Lost? And I think you'll be richly blessed by uh, reading that book. And again, if you participate in the program this evening, uh, at the end of the presentation, Pastor Doug gave those who are here in the studio mm -hmm. and those who are watching online an opportunity to respond. And we want to encourage yeah. you, even if you're watching this at home or wherever you might be, uh, go to the Revelation Now website and you can click on the decision card. Uh, just read through the different questions and prayerfully mark uh, your response. Uh, send it to us. We've got some additional resources we'd like to provide to help you in your walk with Christ. So take advantage of that. Go to revelationnow.com, fill in that response card. Amen. And yeah, please make sure and tune in tomorrow night. You're going to find this to be a very encouraging presentation with all that's going on in the world right now. I think we need it now more than ever. And it's not too late to invite your friends. If you have no friends, invite your enemies because Jesus is coming soon and we want to be ready for that event. Thank you so much, friends. God bless you and we'll see you again in our study tomorrow night.